Dean Averick, faculty, students, parents, friends of SCAR, and supporters of peace, thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. It is such a great honor to be with you, and it gives me such tremendous hope to see you, the newest generation of practitioners and scholars, beginning your peace-building journeys in an increasingly turbulent world. So when Dean Averick asked me to speak with you today, I burst into tears. While those of you who know me know this is not an uncommon occurrence, it is an indicator of the deep admiration I hold for SCAR. In the course of this talk, I will honor a particular generation of SCAR leaders, but I was struck as I look back over almost 30 years as a peace builder at how deeply SCAR faculty and graduates have influenced my own thinking and practice in the most impactful and joyful ways on almost a daily basis. The list is too long to read here, but every one of you has lived and taught the most powerful peace-building values. You and your students weave intellectual brilliance together with creativity, honesty, passion, and deep commitment to nurturing new generations of peace-builders. As I look at what you have built, moving from the townhouse in Fairfax to a full-fledged school, or should I dare say empire, within George Mason University, I am deeply moved and grateful. And you, the students graduating today, are the pioneers of peace, facing a world of increasing violence, polarization, and people fleeing their homes in heartbreaking numbers. You are also facing the breakdown of the liberal order in which my generation grew up, and which kept a highly militarized peace throughout the Cold War and the post-Cold War period. But I am full of hope, since you will bring fresh tools and perspectives to these wicked problems and will shape the world in your own image. And while I do not know all of you, I can predict one element that brought all of you here today. I am absolutely convinced that peace building is not just a field of work or study, but is a calling. And even as the field has become more technical, every single peace builder I have met sparkles with a certain passion and optimism that reach far beyond simply a professional interest. Today, I'd like to tell you a story of how I responded to that calling and how a six-month window of time when I was close to your ages profoundly shaped who I am today and revealed the truths that I hold most dear about peace. So 30 years ago today, I was a very unhappy law student. I had come from a blissfully happy undergraduate focus on comparative literature and was thrust into what for me was a completely strange and alien world of complicated legal, legal procedure and an adversarial approach to resolving conflict. This was not helped by a civil procedure professor who taught procedure using metaphors from opera and football. To this day, I remain confused about what a summary judgment motion has to do with the flight of the Valkyries. But during my first summer of law school, I decided to work with death row prisoners in Georgia since I felt personally deeply conflicted about the death penalty and wanted to see for myself how law operated in the most dire context. I worked for a group called Team Defense, and my first case involved an inmate named Joseph Thomas, a young African-American man of about 21 who had already been on death row for three years. Joseph and a friend living in rural Georgia had robbed and knocked unconscious the insurance agent who came door to door to sell funeral insurance to, pa to families. The young men panicked and hit the salesman over the head with a shovel and then buried him, still barely alive, in a shallow grave. Yes, this was a tragic and stupid crime, and there's no question as to the guilt of the young men. And yet at the same time, it was also true that Joseph was assigned a completely incapable defense attorney who botched the trial in ways that were obvious even to my opera and football-oriented legal eye. I worked for several weeks on the legal elements of the case, drafting petitions for habeas corpus, writing motions for a new trial, and highlighting the evidence of ineffective assistance of counsel. And then my life changed. Millard Farmer, who ran Team Defense, asked me to do two things. One was to read a book called Getting to Yes and to draft for him a presentation on negotiation. The other was to drive down to the Georgia-Florida border to gather mitigating evidence from Joseph's family and friends that could possibly be used in a new trial. Getting to Yes was a revelation. The book put into words concepts I had been fascinated by ever since I was a child 
and revealed what I was seeing even in the complicated dance between the prosecution and defense in Joseph's case. But this is secondary to the real story. What changed me most and opened me up to the call of peace building was the time I spent with Joseph and his family. There were no cell phones in those days, so I would call family members and friends from a payphone in a Wendy's parking lot. Directions would be something like, take the third dirt road and we are in a clearing by the tree with the bottom branch hanging down. When I talked with Joseph's siblings, I heard the story of all 10 children sharing two beds and grabbing clothes from a communal box in the middle of the living room. I saw firsthand the chaos that poverty, poverty creates and saw Joseph as a lost soul whose very basic needs were never met. Yes, he was a killer, but he was also a victim of terrible childhood trauma and the legal system rigged against poor black defendants like him. I was also struck by the warm welcome that Joseph's family gave me, a white northern woman nosing around his most private life, probing a deeply dysfunctional childhood. I'm not sure I could have done the same if the tables were turned. When I was done with two or three trips to the area where Joseph was raised, I visited him in prison for the first time. I can attest to the panic I felt when the metal doors closed behind me and I was sitting in a room alone with a death row inmate. Yet I was not prepared for a gentle man with large eyes and a soft voice who nodded his head and smiled when I told him about the people I visited from his home. We had a good rapport and I visited several times over the course of the summer as we built mitigating evidence for his case. I returned to school before his case was formally, her formally heard, but I can tell you that eventually Joseph was taken off death row and sent to the general prison population for a life sentence. I was still deeply troubled but fascinated by this case. How could I square the murder with this gentle man, knowing both to be true, and how could I understand the links between the societal and personal factors leading to the mur murder? And was there a role for redemption, or was I being a cliche of an urban intellectual who was blind to the hard criminal facts because of my need for social justice. Coincidentally, or perhaps providentially, when I returned to law school, Stanford had become one of several theory centers funded by the Hewlett Foundation to build these intellectual underpinnings for a more powerful conflict resolution field. Stanford Center focused on the barriers to conflict resolution from perspectives of law, business, economics, and psychology. Now this was procedure I could understand without a football metaphor. I became a fellow of the center and knew that I found my life's work with a slight side venture as a bankruptcy lawyer, but that's another story. The idea that peace was multifaceted and multidisciplinary and getting to learn from legends like Amos Tversky and Kenneth Arrow who led the center profoundly shaped my vision for how to make peace in the world. Now at the same time, George Mason's ICAR, as was known then, was also a theory center. Now I will never forget that I was assigned to drive Dennis Sendoli whose death we are mourning this month and whose life we are celebrating, whenever he, wherever he wanted to go while visiting Stanford. As we drove around the foothills, Dennis regaled me with stories and philosophy about his work connecting the theory and practice of conflict resolution, both within the US and internationally, and I was entranced. During the Cold War, it was almost unheard of for civilians to reach out at a purely non-governmental level to speak to other civilians about making peace. When Dennis spoke, I felt like the clouds parted and a new future was revealed to me, where I could be part of resolving conflict rather than instigating it. And this led to my work over the next three decades, helping nurture the field of peace building and facilitating civil society level peace processes in the Middle East, the Caucasus, and a series of what we now call fragile states. But soon after that wonderful drive with Dennis at a Hewlett Theory Center conference held in Washington, I also met Sarah Cobb, newly arrived at ICAR in her Sarah-mobile, who showed me that narrative was not just relegated to literature, but was a founding principle of peace building. I met Sandy Cheldellen, one of the most joyful people I've ever known, and then Chris Mitchell, Wallace Warfield, Kevin Averick, and Richard Rubenstein, every one of whom seemed like a giant to me, and who demonstrated the intellectual curiosity and passion for peace that were destined to change the world. So you can see how deeply SCAR is woven into my own calling as a peace builder and why I feel such an emotional attachment being with you today. But now I want to show you something. About four months after I returned back to law school, at about the time I was meeting SCAR's leaders, this sweater arrived in the mail. I'll leave it here so you can admire the handiwork. Joseph Thomas knitted this for me. At the time, I was overwhelmed by the gift 
and all the paradoxes it represented. And I spent the past 30 years seeking the answers. The lessons that I learned that summer about building peace in the shadow of the law, about social and racial inequality, violence, justice, anger, corruption, redemption, and the complex dynamics behind criminal acts forever colored my view of peace building. And here are a few of the lessons I would like to share with you, with you which started to emerge at the time that Joseph knitted the sweater, which have guided my life in peace building since then. First, recognize dignity as the DNA of peace building. Donna Hicks has written beautifully in this subject. One of the first signs of deadly conflict is a dehumanization of the other and a growing sense of contempt for those who do not share your views. Only when you recognize the dignity of the enemy, even if you disagree profoundly, can peace take hold. Second, you must learn how to handle anger and Shakespearean levels of emotion. People living through war are facing the most profound, toxic, and traumatic experiences possible in life. And even around the most polished peace tables, emotions surge. Learn to recognize your own and to absorb those whirling around you. Third, no matter what part of the peace building field you may consider your professional home, make it your life's work to understand forgiveness and how it works differently in every society. One of the most powerful examples I've ever seen was in Colombia last year, where a policeman blinded by a FARC firebomb coincidentally met the FARC leader who'd ordered the attack when both attended a workshop led by the Foundation for Reconciliation and Forgiveness in Bogota. After the initial anger and shock of their meeting, both recognized that they were victims of the conflict in different ways, and they forged a surprising friendship, including introductions to each other's families. Forgiveness can happen, but it's not automatic. And in our own culture in the United States, we tend to forgive far too easily. Oops, sorry, is not enough. When I worked in the Caucasus, an anthropologist from Armenia described the symbolic forgiveness process that could end blood feuds in the region. According to him, a young man from one clan involved in the feud would need to run into the encampment or home of the enemy, find the matriarch, lift her blouse, and embrace her as a child would embrace his mother. If the young man survived running past all the armed guards and embracing the matriarch, a blood feud could be considered to have ended. Now, I honestly don't know how, to what extent this story was apocryphal or overly symbolic, but it did resonate with me when during a process I was facilitating with Armenians and Azerbaijanis, a group of Armenians demanded from the group of Azerbaijanis an apology for the genocide carried out by the Turks a century before. It was puzzling to the Azerbaijanis because they're not Turkish, and the genocide so far predated this work. But they understood at some level the idea that both sides were victims and apologies were needed on both sides. Fourth, you must be a social engineer. Like the warp and weave of this sweater, you'll need to combine an understanding of process with deep knowledge of the structures and institutions that societies need to build resilience to violent conflict. John Paul Lederach wrote nearly 30 years ago about a process structure gap in peace building which you as new peace builders must always try to bridge. Goal 16 of sustainable development goals are just one manif manifestation of these links between process and structure. I feel this gap is one of the great challenges we are still facing as peace builders. Fifth, you must understand the brain, one of the newest frontiers in peace building. With the explosion in neuroscience over the past decade, we are gaining new understanding of the effects of violence and trauma on the brain, and also ways to rewire the brain for peace. We've even learned that trauma is passed along epigen epigenetically, not just metaphorically, across generations. All of you will need to design programs that are neurosensitive, with a strong understanding of our hardwired hard response to social norms and values, in-group and out-group dynamics, and the powers of altruism and compassion. Note that in psychological and neuroscientific studies of a range of social scholars and activists, peace builders had a stronger capability than most people of keeping two realities or competing set of facts alive in their brains at the same time. Six, recognize humor even in the most difficult settings. In one of my first peace building processes, we held a dialogue of top Israeli and Palestinian civil society leaders in a beautiful conference setting in Santa Cruz, California. The participants were expected to wear sl slippers to save the wood floors and to help with the dining chores. I'll never forget washing dishes with one Israeli and one Palestinian leader 
who had spent the day in, in passionate and angry conversation about the injustices of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They stood arm to arm, washing and drying dishes, wearing slippers in the shape of bears and sheep. Both laughed and said, whatever you do, don't tell our wives that we are washing dishes. <laughs> Finally, do not shrink from the understanding or from understanding the roots of violence and war and peace. Peace builders are some of the most joyful and optimistic people I know, yet they understand how to look darkness in the face. As much as you need to learn about peace, you also need to understand violence. You must recognize paradoxically that it's often the very perpetrators of violence who become the most powerful champions of peace. Now over the years, I've had any number of scholars raise a supercilious eyebrow and say, peace building is a theory of everything. And I say back to them, damn straight it is. And that's as it should be, because we need peace building everywhere. We need your skills everywhere. And not just at wonderful organizations like Search for Common Ground or the Holocaust Museum. In every path of life, home, school, family, business, the skills you have mastered are central to the safety, security, and dignity of all citizens in a violent world. We need to mainstream peace and make sure that peace loses any whiff of Birkenstocks and love feeds. Peace represents serious, powerful security for all levels of life, and every child needs to learn the basics of conflict resolution as part of becoming, part of becoming a citizen of the world. You are all the standard bearers for this mainstreaming of peace. And finally, I'd like to make a plea to all of you to focus at least some attention on making peace here in the United States. We need your vision, creativity, and your laser-focused application of conflict analysis to help overcome the polarization, pain, and corrosiveness that is eating deep fissures into the fabric of our society. So I want to thank Eskar again for this invitation, and also to thank my husband Lawrence, who's here in the audience, and who has supported my peacebuilding quest with great patience and understanding. As you graduate today, I have deep faith in all of you, and I wish you joy, strength, and perseverance as you move into the world as peace builders. <laughs>